It is Sunday morning. Time for the Dad in a Rock After Show. This is Sean. And this is Chris. And today we're talking about the peripheral, and we're also talking about Star Wars Andor. Uh, it's down to down to two. Just down to two. Ago, it's getting slim. Two. Yeah. Well, we had another one that we were going to talk about. Um, oh, sh- <laughs> <laughs> I dropped the ball on that one. I should I say I should I dropped the Jedi. <laughs> yeah. Only one of us actually watched him. <laughs> Haunting 15 minute episodes. <laughs> oh, I, I couldn't last 15 minutes. No, you I watched just, one episode and you were like, Well, yeah, that's all I need. <laughs> it wasn't bad, I enjoyed it for what it was, but I mean, uh, it just I didn't have the the time or just completely slipped more. It slipped my mind. Yeah, that's what it was. Boy, you threw me under the bus real I, fast this morning, didn't I you? I did. Well, I have to let the people know. Uh, it may be a little bit of a shorter show. I don't know. Oh, and if they seen the thumbnail to start originally, you had to go ahead and change the thumbnail right, to pull did, the show I off did. it. Pull yeah. it off the moniker. <laughs> um, But, yeah, so to give you a little preview, I don't know. I mean, just to open up, we're only talking about the two shows and, and instead of just jumping right into um, the peripheral I think next week you and I are planning on um, introducing kind of a new segment segment up front where we talk about some of the uh, the week in news, entertainment news, that kind of thing. Not not like celebrity gossip or anything, but like, you know, if there's like big trailers or like an announcement of a, of a movie being made or like delays or like, uh, you know, anything that could happen as far as like pop culture news. I mean, uh, we have Black Panther coming out this, this yeah. coming Thursday, Thursday, Friday. We have I mean, we have the big news where he. Uh, Henry Cavill came back as Superman this past, you know, past week or so, and he and he's, left he's leaving the Witcher. the Witcher. Yeah, that irritated me. I'm, yeah, I would rather see him continue to be Gerald yep. than go back to Superman. That, that's just my opinion. I'm pretty sure I'm not in the majority there, but I mean, you know my feeling on the Superman. I know. See, a lot. This is. I mean, just you're. I I agree with you. Like to a point. Like I feel like. If you're going to make a clean break from Superman and the DC is going to make a clean break and do like new stuff, then even though I enjoyed Henry Cavill as Superman and I think like he deserves to have like a good Superman movie with him in it, because I don't feel like any of them with him in it has been, been very good thus far. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just better. I would rather you're right. I would rather see him in that Witcher role, which I've enjoyed much more than the. But then the replacement and season four is going to be a. Uh... Uh, oh, uh, one of the Hemsworth brothers. Yeah, yeah I'm like the one I, that I, was I, in the Hunger Games. Yeah, I, I, I don't see. I mean, maybe I can be completely wrong. Maybe they can make it kind of smooth and the transition kind of there, but they're they don't look nothing alike. I know. Yeah, and I mean the fa- the way their faces, it's just it's gonna be it's gonna be jarring when you see it at first. The thing is, if the show's good, if that fourth season is good. Can they take you out of that mindset and go right back into the storyline? That's the thing. Right. But it's also Netflix season four yeah. of a TV show. <laughs> yeah, which is like that's saying something. Are we? I mean, was there even a plan for Netflix to give them a five? Is it? Is this just a? Oh, let's just kind of glaze over this because it's the end of the season show anyway. I swear, anything other than Stranger Things, they're just like, well, let's see how this season does, and if it doesn't you know meet our very high expectations and we'll just cut it yeah i mean and, there's you know, very few the crown is one that has survived yeah. uh that's the only one that really comes to mind that's a netflix original outside of the stranger things yeah that has you know gone beyond you know the and normal like, length of time yeah that earned its keep but anyway hey the, you and i got into it just now that's a little preview of uh you know some segments we'll have uh coming up over the next few weeks we'll introduce kind of a uh general uh uh you know uh, hollywood or or movie tv show uh discussion about news uh from that week so that'll be fun that, that's gonna be a lot of fun that's how that's where we started honestly with our podcast yeah. we started with that type thing and family stuff so going back to the roots a little bit it's gonna be uh it's gonna be fun for me at least um so should we just dive into peripheral let's just go right into the peripheral here what is this our past, your future, a museum of sorts. Each of these shapes represents a different phase of the jackpot. Why the jackpot? Gallows humor, I suppose. And it's less portentous than apocalypse. Dude, that's, we finally got a name for it. 
Jackpot. We finally figured out the name of this whole thing is the jackpot, and it's some type of morbid humor <laughs> that they went with. And this whole like reveal hit a little close. I'm like, oh, I don't. Know. <laughs> I, I mean, the time frames that they're giving. Right. I mean, what, what was your first impression of this? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's a little nihilist. It's a little um, doom and gloom, which um, I think that's just easy. I, and this is not like a dig at this show in particular, because I just think this is kind of a trope for all like futuristic sci-fi stories like yeah. Blade Runner. Um, I mean, everything and pretty much anything besides Star Wars, but Star Wars took place in a galaxy far, far away a long, long time ago. So it's <laughs> not even like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's not a lot of hope when you tell stories about the future, which I think can be sometimes um, it's just too easy. You know what I mean? I think maybe it's a lot harder to write a futuristic story where there's actually like hopeful things and maybe happy things. Yeah. Like, so even my favorite one, Ready Player One, it's the exact same thing. Yeah. It's the exact same way. It's, you know, basically, you know, it's civilization, civilization has kind of crashed. Right. And there are pockets of places that are, are survivable. And it's kind of the same way as this. I mean, back to the future, too. Honestly, even though we were well past 2015. But like a vision of the future where people are just kind of going about their day, going to school, going to work, seeing movies, um, you know, the fashion was different and people said like different jargon and lingo. And yeah. but it's like I feel like that's a more representative because we're just we're still going to be around even when stuff gets dark, like humanity adapts and we still like tell jokes and we still like like even when things are dark, we usually are able to like. Push At least try to smile a little bit. Yeah, and a lot of these futuristic um, takes are pretty much just like, well, civilization is gone and like everybody's nuts and it's Mad Max and like, you know, I don't know. Sometimes it gets to be a little and it, it's tough because it's like this vision of this futuristic London is very cool, like aesthetically. Yes. Like the statues and like how cool everything looks, the technology. But then at the same time, they're like living a pol in a police state and like AI has like way too much control. And it's like it still has like these dark undertones of just like, is anybody really happy here besides the very wealthy that are just like, you know, yeah, we don't see top. anyone outside of the really wealthy here. Exactly. We don't see a civilization, a day to day people going about their business. We see these, you know, and we got more indications that this uh, this guy that hired Wolford and this whole group they're they seem to be fairly sinister. <laughs> Well, I'm. I see. I still. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know who in the future I should be pulling for. I don't know. It should be if it's you know Wilford's group, or if it's the uh, the other lady. I, I can't think of her name off the top of my head. Anita. Anita. Yeah. No, not Anita. Uh, the one that visits Wilford. Actually. Oh, Charisse. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. If it's uh, if it's her, it, which one of them are actually the good guys? Because both of them are very, you know, twisted. I don't, yeah, I don't think either one of them are good. Yeah, I, I think they're both. So it's like, what storyline should, should we be rooting for in the future? But I was, I like the fact that when they were back in the, the normal time and there was that conversation, well, what do you do when you get a, you know, into a sim? I break the rules. Yeah. She starts going off. She dies a lot. She figures out a way through it. And then all of a sudden she masters the actual sim. I'll get, just get her body, get them bodies. And I like that. I like that too. I, it's like, I'm of, of two minds, honestly, about this. And the show hit me, this particular episode hit me funny in two different ways. I like that, that scene that you're referencing where Flynn is, is talking to Burton and stuff about how they break the Sims and how, what the strategy can be going forward in this predicament that they're in for them to come out ahead. Um, but then at the same time, scenes like where, her her friends that work at that 3D printing shop are like hacking their way to get her back into the system. Yeah. So they're like they're going hacker to hacker against somebody that lives 75 years in the future. Like then it gets to be like, OK, how believable is that? Do you think somebody in today could hack against somebody 70 years from now? Like realistically, like are they just that good that they can hack against somebody that lives 70? Like you and I know how fast technology changes and yeah. grows. I mean, can you and I hack against somebody, you know, from 70 years ago? I know that doesn't make sense, but like 
you know what I mean? Like the technology shifts so different for me to believe that people in Flynn's present could even like, you know, keep up with people that are using technology 70 years in the future. Like what's sometimes I have to like leave There's a little bit of suspension of belief that needs to take place. And that yeah. was absolutely one. Now I thought the, the way they did it was fun. I thought it was cool. And like how they got her back in, got her out, was able to right. block things. I like the idea of that. I enjoyed Yes. And I'm of two minds of this episode altogether. Like, and we've been juggling this with this since basically the beginning of the show. This is one of those shows that has been too long in runtime each episode. Right. And this one here, the first thing I did is I checked the runtime. It was only like 53 minutes. Yeah. I was like, okay, there, there, there's, you know, a, a good step forward. Maybe they'll trim some of the fat out and I won't get lost in some of it or my mind kind of wander. The first half of this episode, I was struggling. Like, yeah. I want to enjoy watching this show. And I do like the dynamic between Flynn and Burton. I love the idea that her putting his headset on. We've seen her hand, Flynn's hand, kind of lock up. And then mm -hmm. when she got overly emotional and she was arguing with Flynn, uh, Flynn uh, Burton, she yeah. has that seizure. Mm -hmm. But outside of that interaction, I mean, like, I, I didn't get, I couldn't get into it. And then the second half of the show, is when I really like, okay, they got me again. Yeah. When they when they were trying to break the sim, when they're going in, she's just going back and forth. Uh, Connor goes in and he's, I mean, he's seeing, you know, legs and arms and everything again and that whole thing. So there's a lot of dynamics in the show that are great, but this one here, it felt like two episodes to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, and it hasn't been that bad up, up until now. Like I've liked the dynamic between and I've enjoyed both halves of this show. Um, but yeah, the one scene in particular, this episode was when, uh, Wolf decided to visit, uh, blanking on the guy's name, the guy with the boss who speaks very eloquently with the goatee and stuff, you know, um, where he's, you know, sitting and having his meal, at this country club or whatever, yeah. and they guide him in with the blindfold. Is it Levi? It may be Levi. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, and Levi starts talking about. So I guess Wolf learned about His information family? that Flynn gave him. Somehow Flynn was Flynn was doing research, but was she doing research in the past? I guess. Yeah, I think she was doing her current. Like, well, I guess it was like current times with what she is. Yeah. And that's kind of how I read that. But with his name, so it's his family, and yet, is it like his grandfather? Or because that that whole thing was very confusing. Is he and a then peripheral? The, right. Yeah. Like, because so, Wolf insisted when he was talking to Flynn, like, well, it's not the same guy. But he didn't believe that because he went right to the guy, and was like, oh, hey, um, she's got some information on you. She he wasn't like, oh, she was looking some up and she found information on some of this guy. He, he does think that she found information on him, but somehow, like, how does that work with the timeline? And also, later in that conversation, um, uh, Levi drops the information that he created, what, he created his own stub, or he creates separate stubs and, like, tests uh, medicine and stuff on them. Like, stubs being, like, different timelines, right? Where he opens up a timeline. Like, I don't know. I just, that conversation. Just it's getting, Yeah went right by it's me. like there's no morality to what you can do with a stub yeah you can test medicines on it and all this and you don't have to worry about anything down those lines um uh, yeah i don't i don't know man that <laughs> I, I i i'm see it makes me think it's like like i said is he is he a stub is he in the peripheral is he wearing a headset somewhere right so i i don't know who's there and only one that i know truly that's there is wealth i know he's there because yeah. we see him in the beginning of this episode, him and uh, his sister, yeah, in this like post apocalyptic world, and they get basically scooped up and they go off to wherever they go. Then they when we see them when they get adopted by this family, yeah. So, I and man, this one here, like, I guess every season of a show, there's typically one episode you're kind of like, I don't know, right. And I hope that's this episode, but I, I almost I don't want to know anything more about like um, Corbell, the picket. I don't I don't want to go back to that. I don't care about that. But we right, know he was that, totally absent from this episode. And we know that's going to be a big part going forward. There's going to be something that takes place. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know where they go from here. 
I know. I'm just like, I pride myself on like not needing, you know, typically a show like this where you have to keep up and it's like cerebral and you have to like, you know, you have to actually watch the show. And, you know, from the creators of Westworld, I enjoyed the first couple seasons of Westworld. I was able to follow along, even though a lot of that stuff was like meant to trip you up as a viewer. Like yeah. it was like, that's how it was designed. Like it was meant to kind of keep you on your toes, kind of keep you a little confused. Um, and and sometimes I like watching shows like that and then hopping on YouTube and watching like a, a theory show like, oh, what about this? And like a recap shows. Yeah. A little bit like what we do here, except there's other stuff out there where they do like deep dives, deep and dives, theories. And things, yeah. Um, and sometimes I like that. And I haven't had to do that with this show yet. I've been able to follow along. But this episode, I felt like I was just dragging behind a little bit. <laughs> I was a little lost. I mean, I, like yeah. I said, because when. Flynn first went to the future whenever quite when she was coherent of the whole situation. Mm-hmm. Where is everybody? Right. Like when she walked out in London, this is in London because there's nobody here. Yeah. So the idea of this jackpot taking place and all these different events taking place to get into where they are now. And even we 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 finally really learned where she's living. She's living in Spring Creek, North Carolina. And the only reason we know that truly is because of that domestic terrorist attack that took place on the, the nuke silo, which I wasn't aware there was a nuke silo in Spring Creek, North Carolina, but hey, hey, maybe national you security. Be. Maybe you wouldn't be aware of that. Yeah. <laughs> and w- but, and uh, what does that mean, by the way? Like, is that just a coincidence that they targeted her to be a part of this? And yet she, it's her hometown that ends up being the third rung of this jackpot apocalypse. Like, I almost feel like they have they're using her to maybe to prevent the jackpot from taking place. But that doesn't even make sense because when they say the age, the age of the cliff in 2039, you know, the power outages you're talking about, you're saying, she said, that's only so many years from now from them and within seven years. I think she said it was yeah, seven. Yeah. And she asked, is it already taking place? And they said, yes, it's already in motion. So her stopping something isn't possible. So I don't think there's any coincidence with it being her town and them selecting basically Burton for something here who has a military background. Yeah. And then they got Flynn instead. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place. The future stuff here. I need somebody to fall. I need somebody to like, um, hang on to, and there is Wilfred, but so far it just seems like these people in the future aren't do anything they're not doing anything positive or altruistic they seem to be just doing something to like one up each other as far as like corporate espionage and making money and stealing things and there doesn't seem to be like this effort like we're going to contact somebody in the past so we can save the world and keep the jackpot from happening i'm getting none of that I, they nobody seems to give a shit that the jackpot happened if anything they're like well yeah we profited off the jackpot so why would i want to change it like these people aren't like saviors or you know what i mean like yeah uh, oh, i'm reaching i'm trying to connect dots i mean these yeah. the dots may not even be there i'm trying to draw lines to places that don't exist right but because that's the only thing that i can think of that's only is is corbell is does he have any connection right to any of these people within the peripheral like why did they i mean they reached out to him because it was they they made it seem like they pulled videos and they know who this guy is and he can actually be someone that can take care of a problem right but is that just smoke and mirrors so i don't know i i, I need next week i really do i need next week badly and i need something even from uh, the side that we like in north carolina with flynn and um with Burton. Burton and stuff I, you know, if if they've bought into the fact that they are actually traveling, and they're not physically traveling to the future. I know Flynn shuts that down. It's not time travel. It's it's data sending data. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. If if I had a way of sending data to the future, I'd you know send myself some lottery numbers and and I'd win that uh, the you know, two point one billion, billion dollar lottery power. Powerball out there right now. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I need something else from them if they truly believe that they're talking to people in the future and this isn't just some like next level sim that they're playing, they don't seem to be talking about that. And at at all, you know, they're, they're talking about around, they're talking around it as far as like Flynn having her medical issues and, um, but, and they seem to be on the defense. They understand that like, 
they're having people sent being sent after them and stuff. But it's like, I've never gotten the moment in this show, like, wow, holy crap, we're talking to people in the future. What does this mean? What's going on here? Um, how do we use this if, mm-hmm. if at all to like benefit us? How do we, are we able to change things? Um, you, you'd be, if you were talking to somebody that you believe to be in the future, you'd be gathering intel like crazy and not just having these weird conversations, these vague conversations about playing a game or something. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. So far, I've been with it thus far, but it's it's reaching its stretching point. You know when you stretch silly putty and eventually that <laughs> you can see breaks? through it and it starts ripping in the hole in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, honestly, there was a very brief like thing that you're talking about when it first started. When when Flynn realized, holy crap, I'm in the future. Yeah, there was. I mean, they, they said it was very quick. It was very vague. She was amazed by it, but they really haven't addressed it since since then. They've been addressing it as in, uh, we need to stay alive. We've got, you know, four dead bodies or how many dead bodies in the backyard. Right. They've got their friend who is a um, the sheriff who is now kind of catching on to some things or or seeing things. He's just being, you know, I don't know. He's just kind of watching the neighborhood. He's being appropriately curious with them because they, they are not telling him things. Yeah. Um, well, then you also see the handshake between them and Corbell. Yeah, it was very suspicious. So it's like, why why are you getting in bed with him when we know he's not right? And that was another scene, too, that I was kind of frustrated by because it was like, uh, I thought that Burton was going to feed him a lie that would make sense. Because easily, because the way that, um, you know, that crew runs, they could have been, you know, uh, saying any kind of rude things to Flynn or just being a general nuisance. And he could have been showing up there with his buddies to like, hey, lay off me and my family. And I'm asking you as a gentleman, as a gentleman's handshake to like to call your dogs off, have your boys quit bothering me. It could yeah. have been as simply as rural town, that kind of thing. But Burton didn't even give him that. Flynn didn't give him that. They were just like, nothing to worry about here. Nothing to see here. I appreciate you coming over, but we're fine. Nothing, nothing to see here. Yeah. Well, that's been your biggest gripe about a lot of the show. <laughs> like the, the actual, the writing of the show and the conversations that are taking place in the show are so tropish. Yeah. They're like they're short, they're clipped. There's not a whole lot of depth to a lot of the conversations, and they may be doing that specifically for the show itself. The book may be a lot deeper, right? But it's something that the show has kind of fallen into, and it, I mean, it doesn't bother me a lot. Yeah, the, the interaction between their friend, the sheriff, and them at the house felt weird. The beer puts the beer down. Remember, I'm a friend type situation. He's walking away, right? So I don't. I don't think he's long for this world. Oh, really? I think I don't think he's going to make it through because I think something's going to happen. And I think Corbell is going to catch on though, and he's going to he's going to put he's going to stick his nose in a spot that he doesn't it doesn't it shouldn't be. Yeah. Even though he is law enforcement, he's not going to want to find out what he finds out, and it's going to be the end of him. It's and you mentioned it is what I mentioned since episode one of this show is like it was a scene that felt completely unnatural. Because it's like the characters in the moment knew that they had three more scenes down the line. They're like, okay, well, we're gonna left thing, we're gonna leave things unsaid for right now because I know that we're gonna have a scene next week to talk, go further into this interaction. <laughs> yeah, it felt just very TV tropish, TV show ish. And w- when I see that, like w- while I'm watching the scene, the take kind of good. out of it. That's not good. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well, guys, you know what? I mean, we as a whole, we've enjoyed this show. This episode really didn't do it for either of us. I know Michonne and I don't like really dogging on a show. But, I mean, when we get two show, one show that has essentially two episodes within it, I mean, it's kind of hard. Yeah. You, know, you got to compare and contrast the two. <laughs> but uh, if you guys liked it, let us know. Drop us a comment below. If you're watching live, you know, sh- share it live. We'll go ahead and we'll discuss. If we missed something, you clearly knew that we missed it, and it's obvious we missed it, we'll go ahead and we'll discuss it as well. But uh, And if you're new to us, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. And we have another show to hear to talk about, and it is Star Wars and or. Look at you. The Empire doesn't rest one. The rebellion comes first. We take what's left. Tell me you're going home for a visit. They've been after me to find you. Of course. Just came through to see you first and get cleaned up a bit. Seriously, Val, what does he have for you? Who? He 
You're one to worry about. Trapped here, boxed in. Please tell me you're being careful. Things are happening. Things are happening. What did you think of that reveal? I liked it, actually. I liked it a lot. I thought it was out of left field. Nobody was thinking that, like, as far as Bell's. Um, and there was just the smallest of hints that, you know, uh, the conversation she had with Cinta last week, like, oh, hey, you know, she was making fun of her, basically. Maybe I could just go back to my rich family and quit, you know, playing at this, which was a dig at her. Um, and that was the only hint that we had in the rest of the series that Bell had any connection with Mon Mothma. So, but it made sense. Like, it's not like it rung, rings false or anything. Like, they felt very natural together. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I like that reveal quite a bit. Oh, I did too. I, I didn't see it coming either. Yeah. I, I really didn't see it coming. And when she sits there and she's all cleaned up and she's, you know, standing side by side with you, you can feel the familiarity. You feel, like you said, it feels right. There's yeah. nothing, it didn't feel forced. Right. But I'm going to ask you this. Is Luthen familial too? Is there one long, like, familial thing that it, it, it breeds from them? So far, I don't think so. Because if... Um... So it's almost like Mon Mothman was talking about that uncle that you don't want to get involved with. It's like, what, yeah. is, what does he have you doing too? And she's right. like, who? Yeah. Yeah, um, like don't speak his name aloud kind of thing. I, I just, I think that was just a, a cover. I, I don't think, because I think if Mon Mothaba had showed up at this guy's shop and it was known that this guy's shop is her uncle's shop or something or some kind of relation, then that would have come up somehow. You think like more conversation, flags it would have been, been more thrown. prevalent. The way that they interact, Mon Mothaba, especially when they're putting on the show in front of the driver, yeah. It's not like a, hey, uncle, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. How's this? How's that? It wasn't catching up. It was very much a shopkeeper and their customer. <laughs> you know, so I think if there was, a, if there is a relationship there, it would be known to be one. Just like, you know, I'm sure if people know that Val is Mon Mothma's relation. They just don't know that these two are separately dealing in. And connecting in what they're doing. Yeah. Or even doing anything at all. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was. This episode, once again, just like the other one, and this one here has me has me torn. Yeah. Because I don't per se really enjoy the stuff that's happening in the prison and everything with Andor, but I can appreciate it. Like, I was watching, I was like, okay, I, I, I kind of like where this is going. I like the idea of trying to figure out, you know, how many guards, uh, talking to Andy Serkis's character, uh, you know, have you ever thought of getting out? And he's like, I've got so many shifts left. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this. They're listening. And he's like, nobody's listening. And he yells, nobody, he kind of emphasizes this. Nobody's listening. Right. Deal. So I feeds, like all that. It feeds into the theme of the stuff that he's talked about. And Luthen has talked about before is that they're so fat and proud. They couldn't imagine that the inmates could get one over on this like terrifying prison they've constructed. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's an and, awesome and, prison. When it comes to a prison, that thing is fantastic. And even down the line to the original uh, Star Wars A New Hope, like, don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. Darth Vader talking about the, the Death Star. You know what I mean? Like, they're just yeah. so fat and proud and happy that they constructed this thing that's going to keep every planet in line that they couldn't imagine that a, that, that a rebel and his one X-Wing are going to go down that trench and light the whole thing. <laughs> you know, it goes to that original movie. Yeah. Um, and I like so, it. A lot of these things have connected to... There's a, if you pay attention, there's a lot of things that connect to like the the grander Star Wars universe, mm -hmm. where they're telling one story. But if you pay attention, like you just pointed out, there's things that are happening elsewhere as well. Yeah, um, I like this episode. I don't think I enjoyed it as much as some of the other episodes. Um, I felt, and you and I were talking a little bit before going live here, but like I expected with these three episode arcs so far, I expected episode nine to be the prison break where he finally gets out of yeah. there. But really, it was just one more episode to see the desperation of this prison for the people that are close to Andor, including Andy Serkis's character, to learn the truth about what's going on. Um, I do have a question, though. It was something that confused me about the prison. So we find out from the doctor that's assisting the the old guy who's had a stroke, a part of Andor's team there, um, that they're on level two or another section of the prison. Basically, word got out that they had uh, not released the guy, released an inmate after his sentence was up. They just transferred him to a different section of the prison. Yes. 
and word got out of that so pretty much they just fried that entire section as opposed to like letting rumor spread or that that truth nugget escape those walls i guess you know so they'd rather just like wipe all those prisoners out um how does how does this how does this work this whole like thing as far as like because right now these people that are on andor's section and andor's yeah. the only reason that they go about their business and perform the tasks that they have is because they have that number that they're working towards andy circus's character prime example of this so many shifts he's doing it because he's got so many days left and there's the promise of then just being released afterwards you're here you're here to serve a term work during that term and after you're done you leave so in these other sections where they have people that are coming from these original sections what do these people do day in day out are they doing the same kind of monotonous work are they literally just sitting in cells are they like because if you had a bunch of people that were like know that they are not getting out of this prison desperate people do desperate things um like well you think back real quick i don't mean to interrupt you but those that episode those last week's episode where the guy committed suicide did he yeah. know what took place and he knew he wasn't getting out and that was the only way out no he didn't because then the rest of them would know like what are you going to do like go to another level after them just that's transferring true yeah he would talk level yeah. Yeah, he would have talked to everybody there. Mm -hmm. He'd been like, Oh, you guys think you're getting out? You're not getting out. I was just in level five. They transferred me over here after my zero day when I was supposed to leave. Like that information would get out. Um yeah. so like how does this I'm confused on how this works exactly. Like I, on the surface, it makes total sense. Like, oh my gosh, that's that's terrible. And well, this is um, the first time I think or any type of release was supposed to take place after the senate went ahead and imposed that new rule the new law oh uh, maybe that's the fact. and they went ahead and they basically extended everyone's prison time to, to the point where no one was gonna get out and that's kind of how i took it okay. this all took place after that so this is the first instance where someone would have been released under this new rule right i forgot about that that there was a change so there was probably a point in this prison where they actually were releasing people and now and... That, now that the, the actual attack took place on aldani and all mm -hmm. that happened. And now, basically, if you're in prison, you're not getting out. And now the system that was working prior is not working anymore because, and they're running into that issue now. And they don't, the Empire doesn't quite know how to handle it. Okay. That, that makes more sense to me. Now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, I mean, what else is there really more? I mean, I still, I don't like Mon Mothma's character. I mean, I just, I feel like she wants to do everything she can. But I feel like she's scared to do what she needs to do. And I feel like it's always kind of been her character in general when it comes to the Star Wars world. Like she's standing there and she's being disillusioned. She's standing there. She's talking in the Senate and all those Senate you know, cubicle things are all shutting off and they're all walking away. So no one's paying attention to her. Yeah. At what point do we see something come to light on her? Like when does she need to run? Because we have this other senator show up. And she's going to have to go ahead and use somebody on Chandrilla that is basically a mobster to funnel her money, to launder her money to her. Yeah. When is someone going to see that? When is she going to have to jump ship and leave Coruscant and be the mom mothma that we know from prior you know, shows and books and everything? Uh, I don't did Have they announced an Andor season two? I, they, yeah. Yes, they have. They have. Okay. Yeah. They I already come out and said, I think this is going to be a two season setup. Because this season's going to take place, and then the next one's going to lead right up to Rogue One, okay. if I if I remember correctly. Okay, then we probably will see that. We're probably going to see that lead up um, of how she escapes. Um, because in Rebels we get the actual like escape, like the post escape after she's already put out the hollow to the galaxy. Like, I can't stand for this anymore, and I'm leaving officially. And she like makes that decree. And we, you're right. We probably will see the lead up to that, um, but uh, it's got to happen soon, right? Because like the heat's just too too much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's starting to turn it up pretty heavy. Yeah, what's actually going on? And I'm waiting to see it. Like I said, I'm just kind of wishy washy on her, but I want to see will Luthen make it out? Will Luthen be discovered? That's another thing. Because I think yeah. next season's gonna be. I think they're gonna have the the, the way that this show is gonna be set up. It's gonna be similar to this year. This season here, but I think the blocks are going to be years. Mm -hmm. So instead of like right now, we're being told a story that we're we're 
similar it's like within a month or so it's it's not a long period of time but it's a long enough right. i think next season actually set up to where it's gonna be like threes a year threes a year threes a year and it leads right up to where it is so there's gonna be decent size um time jumps in between each sets of episodes uh let's talk a little bit about some of this like uh stuff that's gone out this week do you think uh luthan is a force user and or a sith do you think luthan's a sith no not even not even remotely i don't think luthan has any he he may know of the jedi i don't think he has any force abilities i, I no i don't buy that at all what do you, what do you think i don't the only part of me that is intrigued by that theory is just the amount of um high tech like i can see a sith having a ship like that you know what i mean like his ship and his like theatrics and the way like he just morphed into that other character and like the de the deception i guess but um, something that just came to mind is there i mean yoda famously said there can be only two mm -hmm. we have palpatine and we have vader palpatine would be able to sense him because he sensed out darth maul when he started training uh savage mm. so when he was training said this all took place in the clone wars right but when palpatine sent that out he seeked them out and there was a huge battle mm. so i don't think it can be happening right under his nose like that because that took place on uh on dathomir right where he saw he seeked them out so it was a whole different planet there are two times that yoda really put the writers of star wars things in a corner when he said only two there are, no more, no less. That really limits the amount of Sith you can have at any given time period around this time. And then when he says, you know, Luke, when gone am I, the last of the Jedi will you be when he's dying? Like, okay, so there's not... Anytime that you write other Jedi or other Sith around this era, it gets real shaky. Yeah, because everyone looks back to Yoda. <laughs> but then again, Yoda was blind. Yoda, Yoda let his humorous blind him in a lot of ways. So he may not even be correct. I mean, that's all. I mean, we're we're treading water here. We better we be, I got to be careful in how much I uh, <laughs> diss on Yoda. But I mean, that could be it as well. That's how the Jedi fell. Yeah. Well, when it comes to the Sith and uh, and that's a uh, prequel era, when it comes to post Empire ruining everything and Yoda living on Dagobah, I think I believe that Yoda had a pretty. Come to Jesus moments. Well, I think he had a pretty good sense. Yeah, I don't. I I think he had a mea culpa. Like, I, I don't think. I think when Yoda passed, and by the time he's talking to Luke, like, I don't think Yoda was holding on to the fact, like, oh, I didn't do anything wrong. I think Yoda and Obi Wan both were like realized how much they failed. We, yeah, we done effed up. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll buy that too. No, yeah. I'll, I'll go ahead and I can, I can, I can take that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can see we'll start getting on Star Wars tangents here if we, we go too. Yeah, if we go yeah. too far off the actual show we're talking about, we'll yeah. start. I'll start referencing books, and we don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start getting into Thrawn, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, some yeah somehow I'll get off into Thrawn. And like, were look, the Chiss, the, this is how the Chiss ascendancy uh, fits into Andor. Oh boy! Um, oh man! Yeah, no, we got <laughs> for everyone's sake. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, speaking of which, I mean, you kind of called it this episode. There wasn't much more to this episode besides more of like this prison sucks. There are some lines here. I guess the last episode, you know, the last um, uh, scene where finally Andy Serkis's character is on board. He gives Andor the amount of you know average um, uh, quantity of uh, guards on any level. So it looks like things are going to start, and that's what I like to see when it, when it's finally time for, for the prison break, yeah. being observant, getting schedules, the formulation of a plan, talking in secret. That's the kind of stuff that. Well, they started important. talking to like anything that moves, yeah, is electrified. So they know everything that moves isn't electrified. Yeah, uh, he's cutting at something in the restroom, mm -hmm. some type of line or something in the restroom. Uh, someone's going to have to get a hold and hurt, take down one of these guards and get a pair of boots. Right. Because the boots are, you know, they, they need the boots. So how many, how many are going to get out? You know what I mean? What's this lockdown going to look like? Who's going to send the ship? How are they yeah. going to get off this planet? Is it going to be when they're sending more people in? Mm -hmm. Do they hijack one of those transports? That's the only thing I can think of. And they're waiting there in their garb. Like they take the uniforms and everything. And they're waiting there to go ahead and in process. And then they take the ship. 
Yeah, that's what makes some of the uh, Mission Impossible movies that that formula makes it so much fun. It's just like here's an impossible situation. We're gonna set up how desperate and how you are just not gonna get this done, and then the rest of the movie is like about getting it done. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, so I'm it's like yeah, that's prison break. Yeah, that'll be fun stuff to watch. Do you have any more theories that you heard out there? So you just said there's a few. You know, there's the one with Luthen. Is there another one that I'm not aware of? Um, no, that's kind of the main one that I've seen. Um, do you think Saul Guerrero is going to come back this season? Oh, man, that's a good question. Because we have, what, three episodes left? Uh, yes, five, six, seven, eight, so four. Oh, I'm no, say, no, yeah. we've got, let's see, what are we up? We're on. We're at nine. We're at nine. Okay, so that's 10, 11, 12. Yeah, three episodes left. Three episodes left. You don't show an X-Wing without us seeing it in action in some way in a Star Wars show. You okay. just can't. There's no way. Right. So I think it's possible that Luthen finds out. Does Saul that, Guerrero and his team pick up Andor from this prison planet? Yeah, and he winds up on the wrong side of the rebellion. Yeah, and that's when Luthen gets concerned because he's connected to Luthen. So there may be a point where, yeah, that happens. Yeah. There's some type of attack on this prison, and it's Saul Guerrero's crew, right? And it has nothing to do with Andor. It just happens to happen when Andor is trying to get out, and he benefits from it. Yeah. Oh, uh, one other uh, one other theory. Uh, the first couple weeks, people were talking about how this the serial guy. Um, you know, the uptight guy with the uptight yeah. mother, and the cereal eating dude, um, <laughs> how he's going to eventually uh, uh, work for the rebellion. And I've never seen that. And each week I see that even less and less happening. Like he is so far up the empire's butt. It's crazy. I think what I was is... on that side thinking maybe. Yeah. yeah no, I've, I've thrown that away a long time ago now. What about the scene this week with him and uh, Deidre? Yeah. Oh, man. She enjoyed awkward. that. She enjoyed him having the nerve to step to her like that. You can see it in her eyes. It was kind of a weird sexual tension happening. You can see it in her eyes. So it was, not by her body language or what she actually way, said to him, which don't do this again and stay away from me. But you were looking at the truth coming the, from her eyes. The way, I, the way she was looking at him, the way he was looking at her, just right. the weird. There was a weird tension, and it wasn't like I'm going to kill you. Tension. I don't think anyone stepped to her like that before, and I think he is bound to wind up in ISB somewhere back inside the actual Empire. I don't. I don't see him staying outside in this like bean counting world for very long. It, it struck me as weird. I didn't, there was a little bit of that because you want, so far we haven't seen her interact with anybody in a way that wasn't strictly empire talk and like shop talk and career talk and job functionality talk. You know what I mean? Yeah. We've not, we haven't had a scene of Dedra in her personal life. We don't know what her personal life even looks like. You know what I mean? So it was the first time and it was drawing for me for anybody to like go at her like that in a way that wasn't like in the scenes that we've seen her pre previously. Yeah. I didn't get the same level of like that. She was into it per se. It actually struck me as Cyril being like stepping over line and because he's been so um, by the book thus far. Yeah. For him to go outside of that, I would say comfort zone and like track her down and like all, but, pretty much um confessed to like stalking her being like yeah i i know where you're going to be and i and i showed up here and he like no qualms about it yeah um like that was like a like a badge of honor like you look at, at the hard work work i'm putting in i could I he become her little bird and using it as like a yeah uh, house of dragons type or uh game of thrones feeling i feel like that's where the story is kind of leading us um if so then we get have to get over this hump of her like um it, he's gonna have to win her over because so far he's he's attempted twice to do that the first time was like during the interrogation where she views it as an inter interrogation he views it like a job interview right yeah um and then the second time where he stalks her down like um you know whatever her eyes might have been saying i the way she walks off from him there was no there was not a lot of room there to be like well come stalk me again tomorrow and we'll see if the answer's any different uh, i think I mean? they're playing like, a long game with this they, they wouldn't have done that twice if yeah. there isn't more to happen with it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I'm saying is that I think maybe it's leading us down that path, but we got a ways to go it's, it, for it to be believable for me. I don't know. It's like, I don't know 
if we've made enough room yet for like a third um, interaction for them to be like, okay, you're hired. Like, I, I believe you. It's going to have to take something major from him to have her be on board for that. I think. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. There's going to, there's going to be something that some big event that takes place that yeah. he either saves her or he provides her with information that he found on his own about Andor or the rebellion, or maybe he's the one that outs Mothma to her. Like right. he stumbles upon you know information from Mothma, or not even Mothma, her her senator friend uh, from Chandrilla. Like he actually finds information about him, but what he's doing with money, and she forwards it. He forwards it on to her. Something yeah. down those lines, some kind of connection to finances, money, pieces coming up missing. Something down those you know those avenues. But I mean, I guess only time will tell with that. And other than that, I don't know if there's too much more to say about this episode. We're going to uh, follow along here and uh, talk about episode 10 next week. Uh, hopefully we're gearing up towards, uh, I don't know, hopefully now that we're so close to the end of this and there's three episodes left, we, you th- I don't know. We may only see the escape of this prison. This may be the, the storyline to end the season, him escaping this prison. Oh, I hope not. I don't want three more episodes of him trying to get out of this prison. I mean, I feel like that's a one. I mean, based on the way this show has been formatted to this point, I, I, I would have a hard time buying it. I mean, granted, we only have three episodes left, but what's going to be the finale? What's going to be the the grand finale of them from this? About a big yeah. action piece, him getting out of the prison, it fits the bill because we've only had one true like action type scene. And that was, you know, the theft on uh, Aldani. Right. Which was fantastic. Give us some more fantastic. I mean, I love the political intrigue. I love, you know, all the behind, all that. That's fun. And you typically we only get that in the books. So what we're getting actually on, on film is a lot of what happens, in, like that stuff people don't want to see in the books. And we're seeing right. that in some of the reviews. So like, I don't, this is, this isn't, this, this isn't my Star Wars, you know, like no lightsabers, no Sith, all that good stuff. Yeah. 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 You know, get away from me with that stuff but uh i don't know what they're setting up like i don't know how they're setting it up for a finale and the only thing i can think of is going to be some type of something from the saw guerrera that's the only thing that would make any sense another big hit that throws you know in the empire into a higher level of you know alert uh, no telling where this story is going to go. Yeah, like I said, I don't know. I could see them ending the prison section next week or dragging on to the end of the season. Uh, I would prefer it to for them to put Andor in a position where we see him more in the era of where we know him in Rogue One, kind of connect those dots. But we'll see. We got apparently we got a whole nother season before that. Um, so that's going to do it for this week, guys. We are Dad and Rock. We come here live every uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time Sunday mornings to talk about the latest and greatest in TV and streaming. Next week, we'll be covering the Peripheral Episode 5, as well as Andor Episode 10. And uh, guys, we'll also be talking about uh, some of the major uh, entertainment news between now and then. Uh, If there's a big trailer that drops, or if there's big uh, movie news as far as like a movie being announced, or, you know, actors falling out, or uh, not doing the show that they made popular, (laughs) (laughs) we'll talk about it. Uh, but yeah, we'll be back next week. And in the meantime, you know, check out our channel. Be sure to like and subscribe. We do trailer reactions and all kinds of other stuff uh, on the channel. So be Help sure us to get to uh, that 500 mark, guys. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting close, drawing ever closer to the 500 mark of subscribers. We'd love to see that. So please help us out with that. Okay, guys. Well, I guess until we see you next week, we'll see you after the show.